This is the Venture Capital Fast Lane. I am your host, Ryan Else, managing partner of Roadster Capital. In the Venture Capital Fast Lane, we will talk about all things fast in venture capital and everything that surrounds it. If it's fast, we're going to talk about it. Growth, exits, funding, cars, rockets, data, software, and much more. We are in the midst of the fourth industrial revolution. So buckle up. This is the Venture Capital Fast Lane. Okay, well, welcome to the Venture Capital Fast Lane. Today we're going to be speaking with Joel Palathinkel. Joel is the founder of Sutton Capital Ventures, which invests in B2B, consumer tech, impact, deep tech, and emerging fund managers. Along with the investment arm, Sutton Capital has built a large community of experienced and aspiring fund managers and institutional allocators. I came to know Joel through getting accepted into his fund accelerator, and we have developed a good friendship along the way. So be sure to check out www.suttoncapital.co if you have any additional interest in the topics that we cover today. So I'd like to welcome my friend Joel to the program here. And uh, so Joel, how are you doing hey, today? I am doing great. It's a Friday. I'm always in a good mood on Fridays. And um, I'm usually a morning person, although it's 12 p.m., but still in a good mood. I'm on my third coffee. So this should be fun. You're on your third. Well, I've only had one. It's a little earlier out here on the West Coast. but. Yeah. Yeah, here we go. A couple more hours to catch up. Yeah, I've got a few hours to catch up. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, it's yeah, it's uh, it's great to have you on the show. So, you and I first met back on uh, probably over a year ago on LinkedIn. You'd reached out to me, and it wasn't more than a few months after that that I was in New York talking about Roadster Capital at the Sutton Capital Allocator Summit, and it was part of your Emerging Fund Manager program which I was fortunate enough to participate in with a host of unique and really forward-thinking GPs who are, are working on everything from Fund 1 up to Fund 3. And you have built a thriving community of GPs and LPs while also working on a company called SpinUp that you you pitched it to JCal a few months ago. So I think this is a good opportunity for us to dig into all that good stuff. What do you think? Looking forward to it. I'm ready to unpack all of this stuff. Okay, so um, from from looking at things, the ecosystem of emerging managers is growing at such a rapid rate, and some are striking out on their own from established VC funds, while others are coming from a more of a non-traditional paths. So what led you to develop the Fund Accelerator at Sutton Capital, and how did you develop the curriculum that has helped so many GPs like really refine their thesis and outlook on portfolio construction? Yeah, you know, after speaking to so many different allocators, different flavors of investors, um, everyone just has their own approach, their own strategy. And I've thought about the network approach um, to be able to get access, to be able to learn, to be able to build friendships. I think when you do it together, you can go much further. And for me, um, I have been actively allocating for Several years now, you know, I came from a tech background and I had my own journey into breaking into venture capital slash private equity. And, um, you know, everyone has their own journey. You know, there's there are cookie cutter templates in terms of how people um, build a career in venture capital and private equity and also start their own fund. So, you know, the the first question, which is, you know, how did I come up with the idea? You know, Ryan, I don't know if you remember, but the reason why I reached out to you was actually about a deal. You know, we were looking at something, um, you know, we're, we're both interested in deep tech and the future of computing and, and um, you know, technology. So um, oftentimes when you're trying to find interesting entrepreneurs, you're going outbound and cold messaging people. So when I reached out to you, I don't know if you remember, it was a cold message. I, I saw a, a post on something that you worked on. And I was like, oh, wow, this is a really interesting thing that you're looking at, you know, what are your thoughts, right? And oftentimes, you know, everyone is trying to meet people, but there isn't really that community that helps to cultivate that. So, um, you know, I started a YouTube channel. Also, Sutton Capital has a community to help people learn about VC. 
Um, in the process of doing that, you know, we we meet other uh, people that are working on really interesting things, and I just found that the community approach lets you find out about things at scale and also learn to be a better human investor LP at scale as well. So I, you know, so for the fund accelerator, um, you know, it was it was really the impetus of trying to find really smart fund managers. All of those fund managers are investing in interesting companies and they have unique networks as well. You know, I mean, the the broad span of industry expertise has been climate change, healthcare, deep tech, computing, um, you know, Web3. There's been future of food tech. So every industry, I mean, psychedelics has been another one as well. So yeah. any industry or sector focus that you can imagine, um, you know, there there's someone working on that. And that person came into that industry as an investor um, through some way, right? And um, all those people come from traditional and non-traditional paths. I mean, there's people that have been medical doctors that have later become VCs focusing on healthcare, you know? So um, so that's kind of how I built the Fund Accelerator. And I come from a software background. So whenever I build something, I'm okay with failing. I'm okay with, you know, it flopping. Um, and you know, you launch uh, an MVP, a minimum viable product. So that's what we did. I was like, look, why don't I get a couple interesting fund managers together and let me find some uh, friends who are LPs and let's all just kind of get together on Zoom and and chat about insights and and share education. And um, you know, had a few mentors that um, that worked with me and told me, hey, these are some great things that you should discuss. And um, that's how the first. Fund Accelerator launched. I mean, in the beginning, I thought of focusing on emerging managers, but the concept of emerging is a term that is interchanged with different people, right? Emerging yeah. managers in the public markets could be a four hundred million dollar fund, and for some people, emerging means you're fifty, right? So, um, so emerging in my mind, it was just interesting funds that were on their fund one and. Um, and focusing on a unique strategy, and you know the first cohort that launched, it was um, it was a lot of fun. You know, met so many amazing people, learned uh, so many great things, and then those people introduced me to new people, and you know it was just a compounding community of amazing fund managers that have amazing underlying deal flow, and then there's also amazing allocators that are supporting these fund managers that have a wealth of knowledge, and um, and I just kind of iterated on the curriculum. But what I found later was that the curriculum was less important. What's more important is the strong bonds that you build with people. To be honest, the curriculum that I have is, you know, like a lot of those topics, if you just Google them, there's a lot of free content. So, you know, I, you can look at my website and just Google or look on YouTube and you could cobble together the same exact curriculum, right? And yep. I don't think that's that special. And based on feedback, just like when you launch an app or a website, you launch something, you get some feedback, and you improve it. And, uh, you know, each cohort after cohort, what I learned is what is most important is the community, the bonding, um, the relationship building. Um, that's much more important. So I doubled down and focused on that and just really focused on growing and scaling the community. So the next cohort after that, you know, it grew from, I think, 15 fund managers to 50, five, zero. And also what I learned is, you know, it doesn't need to be the emerging manager program. It could just be the fund accelerator. That means if you have a fund, that means if you're a feeder fund into Vista Equity Partners, or if you have a private equity strategy, or if you're a real estate fund, if you are a fund, and if you're on fund one all the way up to fund five, you know, you're a good fit for Sutton Capital's fund accelerator. And, um, and, you know, my thesis is, you know, like the best deals in my mind come from friends and other people, um, a group of people that are looking at deals together, um, you know, and that's really what's helped me. You know, some of the best interesting things that um, I've been involved in have been from a text message from someone who's um, who's messaged me. I mean, you've done that in the past, too. Oh, you know? oh so yeah. They really come from text message from a group of like four or five friends that you have. And my vision is, why do I only need to have four or five friends? Because I'm kind of limited in that bubble. Why not have 50 to 60 new friends every other month that all have compounding communities and compounding deal flow? Um, and then when it comes to portfolio construction, 
you know, I'm a generalist, so I have a general outlook on, um, you know, B2B consumer tech, deep tech and impact. And, you know, there's different entry points when you look at all those types of deals. Um, yeah, and, and it's really interesting to see everybody else's portfolio construction and how they look about it. And all of it drills down to what your goals are. What is your goal? If you're a single family office, are you trying to compound capital? Um, you know, are you a venture fund? And, you know, you're, you do you have a late stage strategy and an early stage strategy? And why do you have that strategy? It boils down to your goal, you know? So um, I think for me, it's been really interesting to see different types of goals and then see the strategies that are used to achieve those goals. So uh, I know I've been talking for a while. No, but no that's fine. I, I mean, we all enjoy hearing what you have, what you have going on and your thoughts on everything, you know, from when you and I met that time you reached out to me, it, that was on the, I think that was, I know that was related to the Psy quantum deal that I was involved mm -hmm. in. And so we were talking yeah. about that when I was at, at the event in New York with you, um, I met another guy who was invested in Psyquantum, which was uh, Stephen Lau, who's a mutual friend of ours. And yeah, it's it's been a great deal. And that's pretty much what led us to each other. Because I, I came out and was part of that. Um, the present you, They were doing presentations talking about their funds mm -hmm. to family offices and, and the like. And then I joined your cohort too. So um, And uh, it was great. You, you're right. It was 45, 50 people in in number two and there were a just a great amount of people there um with really good uh values and approaches and definitely it it's a generalist feel if you will because there are people mm -hmm. from all different areas that are attending attending this program and helping one another along the way through mm -hmm. community which is invaluable really if you you get what you put out of it so whatever you put into it you get out of it um, and I just found it incredibly helpful, and I, I forged some really good relationships. So you've actually built um, at Sutton. You built a very large Slack community, right? Mm -hmm. And we used yeah. that during the accelerator. It was a great yeah. way for all of us to communicate with each other. But mm -hmm. outside of that, you you expanded it to have a also a larger public Slack, right? I did. Yeah. I mean, I think when, when you when I've been building this, I've been thinking about the effects of the flywheel, right? So um, we post a lot of jobs in private equity, in VC, um, you know, LPs, people who work at family offices, work at fund of funds institutions, you know, they're not staying there forever. Everyone's kind of looking at their next gig. Um, so I think what's been really interesting is kind of sharing career um, advice and opportunities, the education piece. Um, they're really, you know, when you think about learning about private equity, where do you go, you know, or venture capital, you know, you might go on TechCrunch or you might go on, um, you know, some blogs or there's some other Slack channels, but, you know, I've really just, what's worked for me is just kind of building stuff so that I can learn. And, you know, here's the secret. Just find people smarter than you and make and have them be part of the community and they'll be glad to contribute. So for Slack, I mean, um, you know, we have a newsletter that goes out. We share, you know, uh, episodes from our YouTube channel. We share when there's, um, you know, career opportunities that we've seen. Um, so some of the people on our team kind of share um, that and then that kind of makes people want to get involved. And then um, and then, yeah, and then that's a larger public Slack channel. Um, I've been very fortunate. There haven't been too many crazy people on there. I guess when you think about PE and VC, um, you know, there that that community in general, most of those people are trying to connect and and learn, um, you know, how how to get, you know, how to navigate that career. Um, so in general, you know, haven't had to moderate it too much. Um, there are some people that are, you know, posting, you know, weird things that they're pitching, and yeah. obviously that stuff gets moderated. But in general. It hasn't been too bad. So it hasn't been that toxic of a community. It's been very valuable and, and helpful. And I'll tell you, I've met some new friends through that channel, you know, through my own Slack channel. And, you know, what's funny is like a lot of times now when I try to connect people, um, you know, I don't have to do an email. And so I'm like, hey, they're actually in Slack. Just like look them up. And um, they're in my Slack. And then all the fund accelerator people are in the same Slack as well. Um, and then we have kind of the private groups for the, you know, individual cohorts that you were in. But, um, but yeah, I think it just kind of, you know, through content and community and, 
And um, just through our website, you know, we've been just kind of seeing a lot of interesting people come in and flow in through that Slack. Um, yeah, that so that great. public Slack channels, it has 24,000 people in it when I looked last night, which mm-hmm. is up quite a bit from when when I was first uh, on there. But holy yeah. cow, that's incredible. So congratulations. Thank you. Uh, that's huge for community. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's definitely adding a lot of value to a lot of people. I think, I think there's um, a huge point of value that's taking place right there around... Um, like understanding of what's going on in just within the field of finance for people who are looking to mm-hmm. break in. Uh, those who ha- already have funds and are involved in cohorts, they've kind of figured out their own path, if you will, already because they're yeah. already at that stage. But there have to be others who are still very early career or just coming out mm-hmm. of college or you know just graduating from you know a graduate program with a, a focus or an interest in moving into to PE VC and, and but making, one thing that so you'll learn nice. too and you, you know you're probably seeing this Ryan is like you know just like doctors you know doctors have to get recertified every year right or every every three four years they got to get recertified and I think it's the same for other practitioners um, we don't have that in venture so what I still feel that's valuable obviously You know, you and I are actively, you know, we have our own practice, but people who are working at, you know, Sequoia Capital or these other funds, you know, what's difficult, number one, is to get a job in venture capital and get into the space. What's just as difficult is to stay in VC. You see a lot of people that, um, you know, join an amazing firm, but then for some reason they didn't last there that long. So there's a value also in um, you know, continuing your education and best practices. So for me, I get a lot of value also when somebody posts like some type of new model for portfolio construction or some type of best practices. And there's always just things in the news that are moving the industry. Um, so having something that's almost like a news feed that keeps us up to date um, helps us just continue our education and continue just being better at the, at the craft. Um, yeah, so I think that's another piece on top of it. Like, you know, you're aspiring, you finally break in, um, but you want to stay employed as, um, you know, a practitioner of that firm. And then if you're starting your own firm, um, obviously, you know, just staying up to date and also just kind of refining your skills. Yeah, it's tough. It's tough uh, because they're, they're in many firms, there's not a clear partner track. And then yeah. when you are hired, um, if you if you are hired, Mm-hmm. like sometimes it's just it's just not as transparent as you would hope that it yeah. is and as you move through the you know if you as you kind of move along at the firm you start to realize well maybe this is for me or maybe it's not or you just don't align with some of the values mm-hmm. or something dirty comes out in the news it's a small uh community still at this point the industry um yeah. there are and now we have all these really big funds that are raising like billions of dollars and they, they've got partner tracks there but the share of carry is split up in so many different ways nobody mm-hmm. it, it would seem to me that not everybody's on the exact same page and uh yeah. the title partner is kind of loosely used you know there's operating yeah, look, partners I mean, a venture lot of partners these things come so from forth. just a, a trigger that creates frustration right yeah. like we're you know there's really really smart people and you know they're working at a firm. They're they're working twenty. I mean, they, when when you and I understand the the work life balance, we understand what you do every day as an investor. Looking out, and this is me too, right? I mean, it just looks like such a sexy job, such a sexy industry. Um, I was just talking to somebody about this yesterday, you know. But when you really realize like what the work entails as an associate or an analyst, right? You're you're grinding every day, building relationships. You're going to demo days. You're going to startup events. You're judged based on the quality of your deal flow that you're bringing in every Monday. Um, so it's not it's not like a nine to five job. It's really a lifestyle, right? Especially if you're working for some of these big firms, um, it needs to be integrated into your life somehow. Um, and you have to control your balance as well, right? I mean, you you know, especially when you have a family and. Um, you know, now that we, we're both uh, parents, you know, I think it helps, you know, that helps us actually be more efficient with our time. We have to time box and say, look, we got to get all these things done before five because, you know, 530, 6 p.m. is family time. 
Um, and, you know, I, I don't want to be, you know, taking work emails when like I, I met, you know, and, and miss out on valuable time with family and, and people that, you know, matter. But um, but yeah, I think it's just so for me, it's been interesting to see these really smart people that are at firms. They really put in a lot of time. They they're sourcing and screening deals. And there's a level of frustration because they're like, wow, you know what? I, I think this is still a good deal. It didn't go through the investment committee. Um, and, and then they follow through with those deals and they realize, wow, those companies were amazing companies that were uh, now part of the anti-portfolio. So I think what happens then is like, the, you know, some people discover that, wow, I can actually do this myself. I actually don't have imposter syndrome. I, I can actually... I have the talent. I can do this on my own. So that's one path. And then there's a bunch of people that, you know, they work at IBM and they've built a huge track record with the syndicate on the side. And then they close a $15 million fund while they're at IBM. Um, I'm, I'm actually like replacing IBM with a different company. Yeah. <laughs> there's somebody yeah. that's done that. But, you know, like I know someone that's closed their entire fund part time and um, they left and they're deploying that capital. And now they're actually already raising uh, fun too. Um, so, you know, again, you know, there's a, there's no clear path and, you know, going back to goals, you know, if you have a goal, like, you know, y- you got to be creative in terms of how you're going to achieve that goal. Yeah. You have to be creative. That's for sure. And yeah, time boxing is so critical because there are so many moving parts, whether you're a mm-hmm. sole GP or you have a partner, um, no matter how you approach it, it's going to be, like the Wild West. There's a mm-hmm. lot of moving parts. You have to have some form of structure in place. Otherwise, you lose track and you lose focus. So, uh, yeah. you know, like you've bringing in deal flow, communicating that to your uh, potential LPs while also raising a fund at the same time. I mean, you're, you're juggling uh, all mm-hmm. of the time and yeah. uh, communicating that effectively to both founders and or to LPs where you're at how you're viewing things, what your timeline is, how you can or cannot warehouse an opportunity or make commitments. You know, <laughs> reputation is a really big part of this uh, mm-hmm. business. And if you mislead people, it'll get around. Uh, yeah. Or it could come back and bite you when you least expect it. So I think there's um, a very strong uh, value that ought to be placed on your ability to be transparent uh, with each side of the table that you're speaking mm-hmm. at. So uh, what what really has been the most meaningful takeaway for you uh, with the, all of this growth at Sutton Capital Ventures and with the Emerging Manager and programs? I would say the most important thing is just to have fun, you know, and meet great people. And for me, I I always try to think about how I can go bigger and how I can make these these things flow into each other, right? So I think the biggest thing for me is um, obviously being mindful of my time. I've been expanding my team, um, helping me. Um, so I think what's been interesting is now I, I'm able to kind of offload things one by one to other people. So I think the a big thing with leadership is – taking tasks that aren't the most critical and finding talented people to manage those tasks so that you can do other things. And I think what you can't really delegate is relationship building and networking. And I'd say some of the most successful people spend all their time building relationships and um, and building their own personal brand. And then, you know, a lot of the operations, the logistics, the um, the coordination, you know, those are things that you can find talented people to help manage for you. I would say in business, what's a lesson is there's different components of a machine. And if you're a CEO, there's always leaks, right? So whether you have um, traffic coming in or you have a funnel or you have sales and marketing, you know, there may be one, you know, there may be one piece of that component that breaks and you have to kind of maybe one person leaves or like one person um, is not doing well. So, you know, you as a CEO um, and me kind of building uh, multiple businesses, you're kind of fixing those leaks all the time. And um, sometimes that that as a CEO is not as fun, 
Um, and, you know, an, another takeaway, I, I mean, I, I watched Elon Musk. Elon Musk doesn't actually enjoy being a CEO. He's mentioned that, no. you know, as a CEO, you have chores. You know, you got to do a bunch of different things. You have to, you know, obviously manage people. Um, he prefers being a product person. And, you know, it's it's just introspectively looking at me. I was a product. I was an engineer. I was a product person. And I was like, man, you know, product is, um, you know, at some point you're going to hit a ceiling. Um, that's why I want to get into VC because I can really, uh, you know, hopefully invest in great companies and be an investor. But I find myself becoming a product person again. I'm building websites. I'm building an app and a web platform. Um, I'm building product again. So it's just it's it, what's been profound is kind of me finding myself and kind of going back to who I am, um, but still kind of making it um, all fit into the same puzzle together. So I think it's for me, it's like trying to um, continue building stuff, um, not build too many things that are overwhelming for me. And then, you know, try to find people that can help me um, to do this, you know, but my vision is to, um, you know, have the community, which I built first, and now see if technology can support that to um, exponentially grow that community and build tools to support that community. Yeah, um, in in a lot of ways, we're, we, we're all like intertwined with our own unique traits and abilities mm -hmm. and value adds. So we're like, like a textile. I mean, we're kind of, you're weaving your own fabric, right? And yeah. your fabric of Sutton Capital, a lot of it, all of it is really built upon your, your vision and your purpose mm -hmm. as an individual and how, how it all comes together. Yeah. It's not, it's not, clearly defined on paper there's a roadmap mm -hmm. that you're following but you're just adding all those really unique interesting characteristics that that make you who you are and when you can present it clearly as you're now doing mm -hmm. you start to gain traction and interest and you you build up momentum and that's yeah. where you're at and it's and really nice you, to see that know, come you together have to kind of not be so hard on yourself right i think loving yourself is important so for me like look i mean i I'll just launch something, get some feedback. Sometimes it's not, um, you know, perfect product market fit. But then what you do is you get feedback and in and listen to people. You don't have to listen to everybody and do exactly what everybody tells you. But it is important, you know, to take all those data points and synthesize it and then come up with a holistic approach. You know, so that's just that's what I did with the Fund Accelerator. Uh, we're going to talk about the LP Accelerator. I mean, the first yep. LP Accelerator is a pilot, you know, and yeah. I'm going to get a lot of great feedback. I have a starting point. Um, spin up was a pilot, you know, and I got a lot of great feedback, you know, and there's going to be a 2.0 coming out soon. So, um, so I think, you know, just being excited to just go on an adventure and run with it and, you know, just know that, Hey, that's not the end all be all. You can iterate on it. You can tweak it. Um, you know, that's been a lot of fun and, and a lot of challenge too, but, uh, but you know that's what learning is. You yeah, know? that's what I feel like. That's what life's about. You know, you learn, um, you meet great people, and you kind of iterate on on all those things. Yeah. So okay. So let me ask you a separate question, mm -hmm. a bit different. You yeah. were just recently at a um, a a GPLP event in Southern California, right? Or mm -hmm. maybe one in New York. You you attend them often. So I yep. think you know in the current macroeconomic environment, you know we all we all know that timing impacts fund performance, and mm -hmm. in this current market, we're seeing many fund vintages have to mark down valuations or explain to LPs why they have not done so already. Are you starting to hear many emerging managers or managers mm -hmm. further down the line, or even LPs, talk about this as you move around these circles? Yeah, I mean, I think that's just basic messaging to clients. Um, you know, even if you work in wealth management um, and you have institutional clients, right? The the market is going up and down, and you have to be able to message um, updates. And you know, it's it's very dishonest, and obviously, you lose some authenticity if you just tell them everything's going great. Right. I mean. This is private equity and venture capital. It's not, um, you know, bonds and commodities, right? So there's a inherent risk and an expected risk. And, you know, the way that you handle things in tough times is going to be a good indicator 
uh, to an LP where, you know, to, to know like, Hey, you know, is this a lifetime relationship, you know, and, you know, anybody that kind of has a fund or institutional vehicle that is saying that there's no, you know, down markets, it's just not reality. So I no, think not at all everyone reality. is tracking their performance. They're working with their fund admins. They're, they're looking at um, how the fund is doing and then they're messaging that in the right way to their LPs. So I think that's kind of a really important skill. And um, you're going to be observed in terms of how you do that. So I think right now uh, with the markdowns, as long as you message it in the right way, um, you know, I think I think it's fine. And you have to kind of try to make sure that um, that trust is there. Right. And I think the LPs, they build that trust when they know that you're being transparent, as you mentioned earlier. Yeah, you know, and the and the other thing that the LPs in venture know in particular, and is that there's a lot of dry powder out there, and fund mm-hmm. cycles are ten to twelve years. So there's plenty of opportunity and time for a company that gets marked down to work its way yeah. back up. And you're right, th- this isn't the this is not the public market. This uh, private. So mm-hmm. things are going to and, change. And, you know, talking about timing, you know, there's timing for LPs as well. So LPs, depending on, you know, when they invested, you know, there's a window where they're um, where they're investing and they're harvesting as well. So there's exactly also, you know, so you kind of also need to be in the same rhythm of the of the schedule of the LPs and when they're allocating as well. Yeah, exactly. So so speaking of LPs where uh, mm-hmm. they a lot of them say they invest in emerging managers. And you have this program focused on that. But mm-hmm. lots of GPs in the category are finding that it's not always the case. And so I'd say let's take institutional LPs as an mm-hmm. example because in most cases they, are ver- they have a very high barrier to entry as an institution for EMs. Mm-hmm. And it typically, you know, they're not allocating to too many new uh, fund managers during their allocation or commitment period. Mm-hmm. So, like, it shouldn't be something that dissuades you from going after them, but you just have to know that they can't invest in everybody, and there's so many mm-hmm. uh, managers coming to market. But really, yeah. in this market, the research is showing that a lot of institutions are re-upping into an existing relationship where they know the manager can weather that turbulent market. So mm-hmm. from where I stand, I think the majority of emerging managers without the traditional VC backgrounds, they should be focusing on LP engagement within their own network of founders, high net wealth, and family offices, Mm -hmm. especially if their fund size falls into uh, the micro category. Because like relationships are critical to build in the long run, especially with institutions if you're looking to build a family of funds. Mm -hmm. But they can take years to reach conviction in a new manager. And they typically yeah. will write checks that are, are right size for $100 million plus funds. So what's your take on how emerging managers ought to approach LPs? So what's really important is profiling who you are and then profiling and imagining who that persona is. So if you're doing a $10 million, $15 million fund, you need to think, who. what does that person look like that would be interested in investing in my fund? Number one, is there an interest for the strategy? If you're a climate change fund, um, you probably don't want to contact uh, LPs that only invest in crypto. Um, However, there are people that are in crypto that are intrigued by climate change. And they're like, what is this? And they're like, wow, you know what? Like, this is really amazing. You guys are doing stuff in the clean tech space. Hydrogen energy is interesting. Wow, I might actually... Um, let me let me get in. If I can get in at a small check, I'd love to kind of be involved. So I think, um, you know, trying to initially profile who you think would be a great allocator would be important. Um, but also, you never know. You know, there could be people that have been really dead set on a certain industry, but they really like you. And they're like, wow, you know what? I really want to um, back you because I just really like who you are. Um, I'm, you know, another reason is like I'm older in my career and I've been very successful. I just want to help somebody. Um, I've heard that one before too. Um, But I think you need to do some type of strategic targeting. I'd say the basic minimum, you know, the basic thing I would say is like, if you're a $10 million fund, don't go after the, um, you know, the 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 endowment fund for the the Smithsonian. uh, Because the endowment for the Smithsonian may not even invest 
in um, a fund. You know, they can only invest in a fund to fund. So a lot of times um, to mitigate risk, larger institutional MFOs and endowments, they can only go through um, uh, a fund to fund because that's just a much more diversified approach. And it's just too much, uh, you know, diligence and time and effort and risk to be able to go directly into a fund, um, you know, let alone a direct deal. But yeah, I think profiling on industry interest and then also, um, you know, check size is really important. And most funds that are 10 to 15 million, I'll tell you, most of their LPs are the head of engineering at IBM or, um, you know, an active angel investor. You know, so you're 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 looking at angel LPs, essentially writing 50 to 100 K checks, ideally. And then if you're um, at 25 to 30, I'm seeing a lot of these funds talk to smaller high net worth individuals, smaller, uh, you know, family offices. And then, you know, as you grow, you look at the larger uh, type of persona. But that's an important exercise at the top of the funnel, just imagining who that person is and what they look like and what their check size is. And also, like, how how can you add value to them? And, and also, what's their reason for even investing? So kind of picturing all those things ahead of time can definitely help you get into the right mindset. Yeah, and as, as you do this and you repeat the process over and over, you start to refine your approach. And mm -hmm. before you know it, you re you realize where you've made mistakes and you just don't make them anymore. Yeah, and then you just start. And pushing one of the things forward. you know, so what, one thing that I did with this recent cohort over the summer, um, I posted a LinkedIn post and then I asked all the funds to please comment with something that they learned. And one of the comments that sticks out, uh, one of the fund managers said that he, um, one of the fund managers said, you know, fundraising for a fund is like sales, but it's not like sales. So you're kind of building a pipeline, but you're not really selling snake oil. Um, you're building relationships and you're building trust. So it's it's not really like a business development pipeline management um, approach directly. However, there are public blogs. I think like Mac the VC posted one, Elizabeth Yin posted one, and Yo Hey is awesome too. Yeah, I think all three of them yeah. posted um, their numbers in terms of how many meetings they took to close like uh, like 11 million minimum, right? And the number is around 1100 meetings, um, you know? So there is, a, there is a pipeline building approach. And oftentimes based on the data that I've seen, there's not a correlation with closing capital and um, any specific criteria. It's really, you know, they've talked to so many people and, you know, some people just invested because they just liked what they were doing, uh, while other people just did not, that they thought they would, you know. So I think there is a, you know, in the early stages, you know, you are really grinding and meeting a lot of people. Um, but you still need to kind of, again, you know, figure out who is the right fit um, and who's going to be aligned to your your strategy and your vision. Yeah, Yohei was in the cohort I was in. It was nice to see him mm -hmm. post recently on he Twitter. He posts a lot of content. He's yeah. also a builder. He's built. He's building some really cool like AI chatbots and stuff in the VC space. So I'm really, really excited to see what he's doing. Yeah, he's he's exciting. He's got a good thing going for him. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, and like Mac, I mean, Mac, uh, I got a chance to ha have a, a beer with Mac when we were in mm -hmm. New York. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, he, he was able to be much more public because of the way that he was out raising. Right. Yeah. So that kind of, that changes the dynamic too. It does. From that angle. But aside from that, um, he did great. Congrats, Mac. Way to go, man. Um, mm -hmm. So to, um, to, let's move forward here and talk about LPs because mm -hmm. you now have something that's new. And I think it started here just this month, right? In September, your LP, the LP it accelerator. Will be, yeah starting real mm -hmm. soon. So um, it's a private cohort specifically for allocators. And it's mm -hmm. a mix of capital allocators from a lot of what you spoke to earlier, experienced angels, high net wealth, family office, and institutions. Mm -hmm. So what are your real objectives with this cohort? And do you expect many of the program attendees will take meetings with or invest in emerging managers from your EM program? Yeah. So, you know, when I build all these things, I always think about how communities can complement each other, right? And you also want to group communities together where they can help each other, right? So 
Um, fund managers in the fund accelerator, there's two things that they get. They, they're they looking for a community of like-minded individuals. And, you know, that support system I've seen has been very valuable to not only me, but, you know, everyone else that's uh, been on this journey with me. And then what in then the LPs and the fund accelerator, what they get is they get to meet a few LPs and then they also get to meet those managers, right? However, there really isn't a program or an education platform or community to learn how to be an LP. Like if you wanted to be an LP right now, where would you go? You know, you can go to ILPA, but to be honest, a lot of things that's mentioned on the ILPA website may not make sense for someone who's investing in a $15 million fund. You know, a lot of times when people are backing 10 to $15 million funds, the way that you're backing them is the same way that you're backing an angel founder, um, you know, so, um, but there isn't any frameworks around that. And the reason why I launched it is because I've started to see so many fund managers on fund two, fund three start becoming LPs. And there really isn't a platform for that in terms of how do you be an LP? And if you think about it, what is the career of venture capital? You know, you get a job as a VC, then you might start a fund, then you're on fund one, fund two, fund three, fund four, fund five, then you retire, right? I think there's one more career opportunity, which is maybe I'll be an LP in the second half of my life. So I want to build that platform and that community to build the next generation of LPs. How do you become an asset allocator? And, and you know, the, the audience is mainly... Um, you know, single family offices, endowments, pension funds, um, you have to be a full-time allocator. It's right now, it's not for, um, you know, part-time angels. Um, however, we, you know, I will probably share a lot of this stuff open source, but I think there needs to be some type of private platforming community where LPs can talk to each other and say, hey, you know what, I'm looking at this really interesting fund. Um, they're focused on, you know, the venture studio model. What do you think about that? And then, you know, those LPs need to kind of have a, their own private Slack channel where they can meet and, and share notes and thoughts. Um, and, and, and then, you know what, like it's an easy jump off point for those people to go into the fund accelerator where the funds will, um, get to meet those LPs and, and network. And, um, you know, I've been very fortunate to have some amazing corporate sponsors, so that allows to have a budget to do, um, you know, GPLP dinners, you know, corporate events, um, you know, allocator summits like the one that you attended. So I think, you know, a lot of these smaller communities and platforms, they all converge at some point, right? The people that are aspiring VCs that end up, um, you know, joining a fund, that fund may be on their fund three. And like they may join the fund accelerator that way, or that person may leave that fund and start their own fund. So they go to the fund accelerator as well. Um, all those, the, the fund accelerator has LPs, those LPs, they could go, those LPs may want to just improve being an LP, right? And again, improve that, that, that trade, um, that craft in terms of how can I continuously be a better LP? So the LP is essentially, um, the LP accelerator, is essentially the continuing education for LPs. And then I think in the future, there could be um, emerging LPs, right? We're already seeing that. I mean, a lot yeah, of you're seeing that. Um, GPs are backing other GPs, right? But the, right now there is not any platform for that. So I think for me, I'm really excited to hopefully be the first ever LP accelerator in a couple of weeks. It was nice to see in the in the emerging manager program that there you brought in a few LPs just to to listen uh, to us give our pitches. Like you would have mm -hmm. an open mic, if you will, during the program where you would give a uh, a mm -hmm. high level pitch of your fund, and an, a known LP would listen. Uh, mm -hmm. And then occasionally it would lead to a meeting. They would either reach out to you, or you could back channel and find your way to get a an opportunity to speak with them and or pitch yeah. them and doesn't mean that they're going to invest, mm -hmm. but to just to, to kind of pick their brain and have them pick yours as well mm -hmm. is a really good practice so that you can yeah. be prepared for those meetings that come down the line that are actually going to materialize into mm -hmm. a true LP commitment. So I, I yeah. found that to be really valuable. Yeah. And I'd say, look, as a disclaimer, look, I'm not a broker dealer. No, I, not no at all. Fundraising happening. Um, 
you know, this is not financial advice, all those disclaimers. But but I would say, look, you know, what's been really great is the mentorship education model. And I think that's a less invasive way to build relationships with people. I went to an annual LP meeting yesterday with a uh, blockchain focused fund and there was a lot of LPs there. And I think it's really interesting because there was a lot of education. So I think that's a really great way. I'll say two learnings that I would say in terms of building an engaged LP community is providing really interesting education and knowledge and having thought leaders share that knowledge. And then the other piece is like, if you're doing something with LPs, make sure it's something that's fun and so exciting looking that the LP just can't not go, you know? And, and I think that was fun. Like when we did the classic car club event, I think that's actually what got your attention. I think we didn't know each other. And then I think we can, I don't even know if we connected through somebody, but I think, you know, I posted something about the classic car club event, which at that time, (laughs) um, yeah, yeah, you did actually, it was right when the pandemic started slowing down a little bit and people were slowly being in person. Um, it was like the summer of 2021. So I did a classic car club event, you know, rented out the club and like, you know, it was only, it was a good amount of, um, you know, LPs there, but I think it was kind of a fun, um, different thing. So, no, and so yeah, that that's right. And then we did like an art gallery, um, exhibit. So I think if you can do fun experiential things, that also is a great way to kind of let people's guards down and actually like be excited to go versus like, renting out a law firm. You know? Yeah, the classic car thing, that's right. So you'd reached out to me. I don't think I got back to you right away. I'm, in fact, I'm confident I didn't because you and I spoke about yeah, it a few times. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, I saw some post about some event at a classic car thing. Yeah. And then it was that's directly tied you. to this emerging manager cohort. And I thought, shit, like, why didn't he reach out to me? So then I probably doubled back to you saying, what did I miss? And you said, yeah. oh, well, this is what you missed. Mm-hmm. And, then I, and then we got to talking. And you said, why don't you come out to uh, New York and present at this mm-hmm. thing and just build a network with me? And I said, all right, I'm not going to let this opportunity pass. You know, and it you was and great. I also bonded yeah. because, you know, we're both new dads. Um, you know, at that time, it was kind of a important time in your life as well you know with all that stuff but that was you know, that was the time all, that is at that event joel that was it was at that event that i had i found out that my wife was pregnant and you were the you were probably one of the very first yeah. people i told at that mm-hmm. event so yeah that's right yeah that was a really good bonding no, but when moment. we first met um you guys were a little earlier in that journey if you remember oh yeah right? and oh like, yeah and, we've um, been trying for a while but i think it's that's what it's all about it's all about just kind of really building a human connection and, um, and, you know, building lifetime friendships, because those are what really generate alpha, to be honest, you know, I mean, um, at the end of the day, it's kind of, it's a people business. So if you can kind of find good people um, to, to be around, I think that's really how you can, everyone can be successful together. Yeah, I think so. So let's mm-hmm. talk about a different type of success. Uh, mm-hmm. You have been working on a company called SpinUp, and yeah. you pitched it to Jason Calacanis mm-hmm. recently. Yeah, just tell us about SpinUp and pitching to uh, J Cal. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, you know, when I think about the you know the the universe that I'm building, um, there's a huge human component. I built the community first. I would say a lot of other people or, you know, technologists sometimes, I mean, they, they do e- either, they, they build a community, they build a huge wait list, and then they build a product. Um, so I had a community, everyone's using Slack. Um, and, you know, all the people uh, that are in the venture space are using all these different tools. And I started thinking about what type of technology could probably augment and support um, the ecosystem, you know, and I was using Google Docs, as you, and I think the cohort that you were in, I mean, everything that I was using was like a Google Doc or a spreadsheet. And, you know, it was embarrassing because there's a few LPs that couldn't access the Google Doc because they didn't have a Google email. So it was embarrassing. I had to like ask them for their personal Gmail oh. so that I can give them access. Um, so I, I, I said, like, there's got to be something better. And if I did the math, like there are all these software tools, but if you do the math, the money that you would pay for those monthly subscriptions, you could probably just build something of your own and kind of customize it and probably make it better and then probably sell it. 
and generate monthly recurring revenue from it. So started going that, down that rabbit hole. And you know, one of the first things that you need to do as a fund manager is just be able to share information um, and also connect with people. And um, you know, that's when I kind of started thinking about spin up. Um, you know, when you're spinning up something or spinning up an idea or a deal, um, that was kind of a catchy name. And then started kind of doing a lot of prototyping and um, I started building in public. I would get a lot of feedback. And the good thing is I had 50 funds that are that are all in the thick of it. Um, so I had the perfect user base to kind of give me feedback and um, iterated on it, took a lot of feedback. And then I started building it. And then Jason Calacanis has this program called Founder University. And it's for people that are super early building technology. Um, you do have to get accepted to get in. I think they only take about 200 people out of 600 people. So I made it to the top 200 and I got in. And it was just an amazing community. It's kind of like the Sutton Capital for founders. You yeah. know, they have, um, you know, the Zoom meeting has like, you know, a couple hundred people in there and all the people are really supportive and nice. Um, you and you know it's it's really good um, content and education. You're surrounded by really um, helpful people, and I was kind of in the process of building my platform, so it was kind of great to kind of get some feedback. And um, and you know I happened to be in the top twenty. Um, I think it was twenty people that finally were chosen to pitch Jason, so everyone didn't get to. Um, so that was really uh, flattering to be able to get chosen to that. And then, um, and yeah, I mean, a, another skill set, which is important, and I do this in the Fund Accelerator, you know, if you want to sh share what you're building, you need to really do it in like a minute or two. I mean, if you apply, if anyone applied to Y Combinator, their pitch needs to be about a minute long. Um, so it's a soft skill and it's an important skill to share what you're doing in a concise way with high level of impact to really get that intrigue from the other person. So I ended up going through the program, you know, was in the top 20 and, um, and got to pitch Jason and, um, and yeah, it was great. I mean, fortunately for me, I didn't really get um, picked on too much or, you know, get any, you know, crazy feedback, but he had a couple great insights. And, um, and I think the insights from him and then also just the community, along with the fund managers, you know, that's really given me a lot of great inputs to focus on 2.0 of um, yeah. spin up. So right now it's spin up, you can have a private group. Um, and I actually ran my entire cohort in spin up, which was really great. Um, so I have users based on the community that I have. Um, and I'm really excited to kind of get to that 2.0, um, adding a lot of the key features and functionality that, um, that people have been asking for. So oh, wow. that's kind of what it is. That mm -hmm. sounds fantastic. Yeah. So at, at this point, the timing the was great because the J, you know, J Cal's founder university ended right before my next cohort. So, um, I was also building to, I have like a tech team, um, but it was a great, um, the timing was really, really perfect because it just like, it was like a launch and, um, I had the beta users cause I had the cohort anyways. Right. So it was great. Well, at, at this point in the program, I usually ask everyone if they have a movie or a quote, but today I'm going to ask you if you have a favorite band or song, because mm -hmm. I happen to know that you like to rock out on the drums every once in a while. <laughs> so do you have something that comes to mind? Yeah, look, you know, you and I have texted about Metallica, you know, um, obviously, you know, some of those old school Metallica songs are good. Um but, you know, like I, I learned how to play drums by playing Metallica and also like Led Zeppelin. And I would say like Stairway to Heaven when like the buildup happens. Oh, yeah. Like that is just like awesome. Right. When John Bonham comes in and starts just rocking out, like, you know, the, the tempo starts getting fast and like it's hyped up at the end. I mean, I just think that's like I feel like that should be the end anthem for this podcast, maybe. But, um, yeah, I mean, thinking about it, that's uh, that's uh. Uh, top of mind that kind of makes me feel happy right now well that's really cool so let me let me mute you for a quick minute <laughs> and we're gonna play name that tune and i'll bring you back on and you can tell us uh what you think it is this all is right. i've searched around i searched around with you in mind so here we go So 
now we're going to ask Joel what song he thinks that is. It's a Metallica song. I yes. just forgot the name of it. It's uh, definitely a Metallica me song. Give me fuel, give me fire. Yeah, give me. F- yeah. He goes, give me fuel, give me fire, give me dynamite desire. Something What's like the name that. Of that song? I think it's fuel. Yeah, fuel. That's right. Yeah, that was yeah. a good album. That, that was, was actually great. the album where they kind of um, changed a little bit. Like I think they cut their hair. No, yep. that was no, that was load. I think load was before fuel, right? It was a big change there. That uh, fuel album. Uh, I don't remember load, if load was Newstead. Fuel, I, I don't remember if Newstead was, was on the there. Main or not. one where they really completely kind of changed their image a little bit and like you know kind of their vibe. Yeah. I could but, be wrong, but that's I don't wrong. think you're wrong. I think you're onto something. So yeah. that was fun. So final question for you. Mm-hmm. What comes to mind when you think of going fast? And it can be anything. I think I, I thought about this last night. I think it's a really leverage. So leverage, the concept of leverage is inputs and outputs. So if you're a um if you're a Airbnb host, or you own real estate, right? There's only so many properties that can generate so much rent, um, you know, based on the capacity that you have, right? To go fast, you know, you need to find a way that you can have little inputs and massive outputs. So I think leverage can help you go fast. The watch point is to not be over levered. Um, But I think about that. And I think that's why I think spin up is really important because, um, you know, spin up could have the capacity to have hundreds of cohorts all in one day, right? With me right now, the capacity is like one cohort, um, 50 funds at a time every quarter, right? So I think um, going fast and going at scale, in my mind, is leverage. Okay, that's a really great point. Leverage definitely can help you speed things up. So, um, Joel, that will do it. Thank you for driving in the fast lane. And until next time, yeah, of course, until next time, I'm your host, Ryan Else, and this is the Venture Capital Fast Lane.